Good afternoon again. I hope that you enjoyed your, your lunch or that you could do a bit of uh, networking while uh, enjoying a coffee. Uh, welcome at this uh, workshop during which we will uh, discuss um, being independent at home, supported by, uh, by technology and technological uh, developments. Um, we have two excellent speakers and one person on video, so I think that we have uh, what, what is needed to have a very interesting uh, session here the coming 50 minutes. Those that uh, would like to intervene from the floor, there will be uh, time for questions and answers after the different uh, presentations. We have a roving uh, microphone, but you also have microphones on the desk, so you can uh, use uh, that uh, as well. If you want to use uh, audio description, uh, then that is available on channel one, and you can uh, enjoy it best when covering one ear and uh, leaving one ear free. That's at least what the organizers uh, told me. I am uh, Luc Selderlo, Secretary General of uh, EASPD, and EASPD is a European-wide network of support services. Uh, we are active in uh, 32 uh, countries and provide all kinds of uh, support uh, services uh, in these countries. Uh, all in all, we represent around 17,000 uh, organizations active uh, in Europe. And the work of the organization is built on three pillars. Uh, we try to inform our colleagues in the field about what is going on at European level, at the level of the Council of Europe, also the European Union, and uh, other international uh, associations. And we also try to inform these international bodies about what is going on at grassroots level, because quite often that is not so, uh, so self-evident uh, for these international bodies uh, to understand. That's the first pillar. Our second pillar is impact. We do policy work. We try to indeed make sure that the, the needed conditions are created so that uh, support services can contribute to uh, the uh, implementation of the uh, UN Convention. Uh, we try to make sure that indeed support services contribute to uh, participation in society, uh, inclusion uh, in the community and um, uh, quality of life of persons with support needs. And then the third pillar, which is directly linked to that, is uh, our our innovation pillar. We are uh, involved in many, many projects where we try to develop um, innovative practices and, and activities, and we try to share that with colleagues from across the European continent, and sometimes we also try to reach out to other continents, uh, and that is uh, uh, also the case for colleagues from the States, from Australia, um, Asia, and so on. This workshop is about innovation and how to better use uh, innovation, uh, I think. And why is that needed? Well, it is needed because, uh, because um, things are changing. Society is changing. The way how we look at uh, the support needs of people uh, is changing. When I started working in the field, we brought the people to the support. The challenge for tomorrow is to bring the support to the people. So the other way around, in the community, where people live, where they want to uh, develop uh, their life. And it is indeed now about um, active enjoyment of human rights instead of being a passive, passive object of, of care and support. And that shift in thinking is absolutely essential and it makes it uh, needed that we invest more on innovation and the development of empowering tools, systems and mechanisms. We also have a boost uh, with regard to, to, to the available knowledge and know-how, the available technology, and it is underused at the moment, I think. Technology is underused uh, in uh, the support work uh, we do, and that is uh, why it is also so important that we discuss these things during workshops such as this one. Technology, specialized technology or mainstream technology, how can that facilitate uh, living independently at home? How can it facilitate participation in society? How can it facilitate active contribution to uh, the society? 
these are elements that we uh, will discuss here. Uh, there is a lot of expertise at this side of the table, but I'm sure that there is maybe even more expertise at that side of the table. So I really hope that uh, thanks to the experts we have here, an interesting debate will be triggered and uh, I hope that we will have a very active uh, session here together. To open the debate, to, to trigger the, the, the questions, uh, we have indeed uh, here with us Sonia Garcia Frail Camara. Is that more or less correct? Yes, more or less. Thank you very much. Uh, Sonia is representing here Fondación Once, and Fondación Once is a uh, Spanish organization, but they also work in Latin America and across Europe, actually, I must say. Um, an organization which is always on top of things. Uh, very innovative, very active, so it is a pleasure having you here, Sonia. We also have a video message, a film, is that correct? From uh, Gail Morris from uh, March in Demis from Canada. I hope that she will explain a bit more what that is, uh, because I'm very interested to, to learn more about it. And we have uh, Errol Crocs from, uh, from Australia, is that correct? Uh, he represents here the Curtin uh, University, and they are already since, since several decades, I must say, really doing very innovative work. So I'm really interested in hearing what uh, you uh, will uh, bring to this, uh, to this workshop. Let's start. I have to remind the speakers, 10 minutes. If they cross the 10 minutes line, I'm armed. So. I will try to stop the speakers then, and then, uh, of course, after the three, uh, the three presentations, the two presentations and the, the video film, uh, we will open the floor for discussion. So if you want to ask questions, write them down so that we can have a, an interesting uh, interactive session after the presentations. Let's start with Sonia. Sonia, please. Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you so much to the ESL Foundation for giving us the opportunity of being here and explain and share these mar marvelous projects. I'm Sonia Garcia, and I work, uh, as he said, in, in Fundación Once in Spain, in the di Directorate of Universal Accessibility and, uh, un and Innovation. Sorry, Fundación Once is a non-profit organization working since 18. 88, uh, 1988, sorry, um, towards the inclusion of people with disabilities in all scopes of life. One of them, uh, of, it, of its aim objectives, is accessibility. Accessibility at home, at accessibility at work, uh, accessibility in culture, among others. Um, sorry. Uh, we are going to talk about the project Smart, Accessible and Sustainable House. Um, uh, it's a, a project about independent living and accessibility. Together with its partners, Fundación Once has created a Smart, Accessible and Sustainable House prototype to demonstrate the possibilities of equipping and constructing a, a house that meets a variety of disability needs. The house, which can be, can be towed by a lorry, was designed to address issues like uh, accessibility, security, energy, and communications. It made a tour across Spain during the years 2016 and 2017. Uh, if it's possible, I want to show you a video while I am speaking. It's a, a virtual, the video shows a virtual visit to the house. We can move across the different rooms of the, of the house, the living room, the bathroom, the kitchen, the bedroom. All the furniture and the devices can be used by all. They give solutions to facilitate their use and also the, the, some of the devices can be, can be used without even touch, touching them. It doesn't. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, after the virtual tour, we can we can see a map of the house, and the rooms have uh, points of interest. By hovering the mouse over there, over them, we can view a planetary video uh, about the contents of each room. 
they are in Spanish because the project was developed in Spain. So, uh, but the videos are accessible for deaf people because they have subtitles and Spanish sign language. The, these videos explain, as I, say, as I said, the content of, of each room. As we, as we have already seen, the project consists of a, a special trailer that mimics a, a family home uh, with an internal area of 140 square meters. And it's accessible for people with a variety of disabilities or reduced mobility. The home includes uh, four rooms, a kitchen, a bedroom, a bathroom, um, and a living room. And it has also intelligent devices, uh, which include, for example, touch lamps, fall detectors, adjustable height, uh, wash basins, and automatic blinds. The house uh, has visited many towns and cities in Spain, and the visits, the visits were assisted by a specialized team of demonstrators and incorporate all types of devices to solve accessibility problems at home. They provide guide, guide tours and answer questions, and additional solutions were displayed, displayed via screens also. The objectives of the project were training professionals who has to do with construction and design, uh, such as architects or designers, and also students, because they are the professionals of the future. Giving accessibility solutions in the field of construction and furniture uh, for all kinds of uh, public and private uh, venues, following the principles of design for all and universal accessibility. And finally, awareness to, for the whole society um, uh, about accessibility and disability. Our target audience, uh, audience were, were uh, public administrations that develop law about uh, products and constructions, and also end users, whether people with disabilities or elderly people, and also stakeholders that have to do with the design and construction, as I said. Uh, the funding was provided by the Royal Board of Disabilities in Spain. Um, sorry, it doesn't work <laughs> now. It's technology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, with the project costing 550,000 uh, euros, the, including the constructions and the touring costs. Between this, these years, the home traveled uh, to 36 towns and cities in Spain, and the home received more than 70,000 visits. The accessible, the accessible home is no longer a uh, touring, but with some kind of uh, adjust as um, variations of the technology and model, uh, is continually exhibited in many fairs in Spain. Um, the model is, has proven to be influential across Spain and therefore has a strong potential for replication. And as Jesús Hernández, the director of Universal Accessibility and Innovation at Fundación ACSES, people with disabilities want to experience the same things as all people but they don't want products designed specifically for them. It's important to advance the concept of design for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia, for sharing that fascinating uh, story uh, with us. Do you have uh, first, first ideas on results? On, on, on is, is the idea picked up and implemented? Um, um, we, we, we try to invite many universities, professionals, to visit the house. So it's the way that we ensure they, were, they are going to applicate the solutions mm -hmm. because there are many things, as Brittany says before, yeah. there are many things, but the people who have to use them don't know them. Yeah. So yeah. That's indeed uh, one of the problems. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the devices, the technology, the know-how is there, but it is not fully used and not fully yes. uh, implemented. Let's, let's go from Spain to Canada. We have a video clip, and I hope that the technology works. Please. Hello, 
My name is Gail Morris and I am the National Director of Community Engagement and Accessibility Services at Marching Dimes Canada. And while I wish I was there with all of you today, I am so pleased that Marching Dimes Canada's Home and Vehicle Modification Program has been recognized as one of the 2019 Zero Project Innovative Practices. I will briefly tell you a little more about the program over the next few minutes. The Home and Vehicle Modification Program provides funding for home and vehicle modifications. Sorry, but it is only audio. Ramps and stair lifts in homes, and installing lift hand controls and reduce effort steering in cars. The modifications enable individuals with mobility restrictions to continue living in their homes, avoid job loss, and participate in their communities. The Home and Vehicle Modification Program is administered by March of Dimes Canada on behalf of the Government of Ontario's Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. In order to be eligible, applicants must live in Ontario, demonstrate financial need and have a substantial impairment that's recurring or ongoing. The program provides grant money to eligible applicants and empowers them to hire their own contractor with guidance and support from a March Dimes Canada barrier-free design consultant. Eligible applicants can apply for grants of up to $15,000 for home modifications over their lifetime and up to $15,000 every 10 years for vehicle modifications. Every year, $9.2 million is provided to eligible applicants through the program. In the 2017-18 fiscal year, 645 individuals received funding for home modifications and the average value of a home modification was $10,656. That same year, 220 individuals received funding for vehicle modifications and the average value of a vehicle modification grant was $13,419. Since 1999, the program has provided more than $150 million in grants to over 15,000 individuals. In 2014, a longitudinal study of the Home and Vehicle Modification Program was conducted. The study showed that there were cost savings for the health system as people were able to remain in their homes for longer due to the program. The daily cost of a home modification was $8 in comparison to a hospital or long-term bed, which is upwards of $135 per day. 75% of the respondents were still living at home after four to seven years. 91% of the respondents indicated that the modifications helped them to do things they couldn't have done before the modifications. The Home and Vehicle Modification Program is the only program of its kind in Canada that utilizes the expertise of barrier-free design consultants to maximize an individual's functional ability. The need for the program continues to grow due to the aging population as older adults are more likely to experience physical disabilities. Since 2011, the number of adults over the age of 65 accessing the program has grown from 40% to 50%. Demand for the program will continue to grow as People with disabilities, regardless of their age, are more likely to want to live in their communities rather than in institutional settings. To enable this shift, supports such as home modifications are necessary to be funded by healthcare systems. Over the years, a countless number of individuals have expressed their gratitude for this program. This testimonial illustrates the impact of the program in a meaningful way. The woman in the photo was unable to access the ground floor of her home due to stairs. It had been so long she had been in the kitchen that she couldn't remember what it looked like. Through our program, she received funding to install a chairlift. Her daughter has noted that the chair definitely improved her quality of life and has brought her cheer by improving her physical ability. Based on our consumer stories, we know that home and vehicle modifications also benefit the caregivers of people with disabilities as they enable independence by ensuring individuals can complete tasks safely and comfortably. The Home and Vehicle Modification Program is entirely funded through Ontario's Ministry of Children, 
community and social services. Over three years, only 25% of eligible applicants have received funding due to limited resources. This leaves 75% of eligible applicants without the supports they need. The demand for the Home and Vehicle Modification Program has grown significantly since the program's inception. This is due in part to the aging population. Since the, popula since the program is means-tested, Marginalized Canada does offer the services of a barrier-free design consultant for a fee for those who do not meet the eligibility criteria. In order to better support people with disabilities across Canada, March of Dimes Canada has advocated for home and vehicle modification programs to be introduced in other provinces and territories. While home modification programs are becoming increasingly common in Canada, there are significant issues. For example, the programs are often limited to older adults, which means people with disabilities who are younger than 65 often cannot benefit the program. Given the need to address the challenges associated with population aging, March of Dimes Canada recommended the development of a National Home Modification Program in its 2019 pre-budget consultation with the Government of Canada. To strengthen our advocacy efforts, we have recognized that an evidence base needs to be built to demonstrate the benefits and cost savings associated with home and vehicle modification programs. Based on the success of HVMP, we are exploring the possibility of linking a similar program with provincial acute health care systems across the country to enable earlier discharge from hospital and reduce pressures on our health care system. For further information on the benefits of home modifications, I encourage you to assess the following references that were referred to in the presentation. Thank you for your time today and for the opportunity to highlight the amazing work that is happening at March of Dimes Canada. Please feel free to get in touch with me at the email provided for further information. I'd be happy to share more about the program and look forward to hopefully working with some of you to introduce this program outside of Ontario. Thank you, Gail. On a distance then. <laughs> There might be, by coincidence, somebody from Ontario, Canada in the room. Is that correct? Nobody from Canada to give us a bit of background information on this? No? Okay. If you have questions for Gail, uh, you have seen her, uh, her uh, email address, and I'm sure that you can find the presentation also on the website of the Zero Project. So uh, if, you, if you have uh, questions, feel free to contact her. Um, Errol, is the Canadian model the way forward, or do you have uh, a more interesting story? Well, much more interesting. Okay, please. <laughs> uh, well, my name is Errol Cox. I work or worked since I'm recently retired in the uh, Curtin University in uh, Perth and Western Australia. My background is in uh, clinical and educational psychology. Uh, I left special education to work in disability in about 1970, thinking I wouldn't stay long, but I did. Uh, and I recently uh, retired from Curtin. What I want to do is describe uh, very briefly uh, a research project that we engaged in uh, from beginning in 2007 and finishing about a year ago that focused on what we call individual supported living. Uh, we take issue with using the word independent supported living simply because if you have a disability or an impairment, the, t the label of independent is very damaging to you since few people with disabilities can be fully, indep uh, fully independent, much the same as uh, none of us really can. So we use the word uh, individual uh, supported living. Um, all right, it's not moving. Can you start the PowerPoint, please? Is there a problem? Yeah. Okay, Here thank you. It still won't move on. Next slide, please. 
Okay, uh, the project is called the Individual Supported Living Project. We began in 2017. The project is based very much on Article 19 of the CRPD, which if you've read it, as I'm sure you have, you'll realise is probably one of the most uh, demanding of the uh, CPR, CRPD uh, um, uh, articles. I've mentioned about uh, the notion of, of uh, independence as not being something, a term that we actually use in the research. Next, please. Uh, worldwide, uh, adults with intellectual and developmental disability are still living in congregate environments. By congregate environment, I mean one in which a number of people with disability live. We might call them group homes or hostels or nursing homes or large institutions. So this research is about essentially putting an argument and a process up that challenges the congregation of people with disabilities. In this case, particularly people with intellectual uh, and developmental disabilities. Um, we developed a manual um, which describes the whole research project and the review processes that we developed in the evaluation component of the, of the research. Essentially what we did was to evaluate the quality of homes of 130 adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities in Australia. We partnered with, the next one please, uh, we partnered with uh, three uh, universities um, in, uh, in this particular project. The manual was revised and we now have a second edition of it that we completed towards the end of, of the project. Uh, it contains eight themes uh, and 21 attributes. Each of the themes has a number of descriptive attributes which are essentially means by which you can observe and document and evaluate the quality of, uh, of each of those. Okay. Um, Next one, please. Uh, I showed you the first three themes. The uh, remaining four themes are around planning, control and support. And you'll see that each of these themes has uh, one or, I'm sorry, three or four attributes that describe it. And the manual contains the, the detailed information about each of these and the processes that one uses in an evaluation context. Next, please. Between uh, 2015 and, uh, that's the last two, next please, uh, we, uh, between uh, 2015 and 17, we evaluated 130 ISL arrangements across three Australian states. In order to do this, we got the support of uh, NGOs and family members and so on, who essentially uh, enabled us to engage with a person with a disability in their setting. We developed tr a training program because the people who went into the homes to do the evaluation needed to understand how and why and uh, what we were using. Um, and we also put together small teams uh, that carried out the evaluations. Each team led by a more experienced and, uh, if you like, more senior uh, evaluator. What were some of the findings from the research? The next one, please. Uh, well, these are just some of the findings. Gender was divided evenly across the 130 evaluations. The age range was 21 to 66. The average age was 40. The level of support need, which was an important issue we were interested to look at because many of the people in the cohort that we used in the research had quite high, very significant uh, levels of support need but they ranged from little difficulty to much needed support. Half of them had moved into this ISL arrangement from their family home, which we thought was very positive because working with families so that they could look at options other than congregate options seemed to be a very good strategic approach to take. Um, the participants had lived in their current arrangement an average of seven years. Next, please. Uh, some more findings. Uh, 
We identified four different types of ISL arrangements. Some people lived alone, some lived with a co-resident who was not a staff person, not a paid person. Some people lived in a relationship or with a host family. Uh, there was a wide range of support hours. Remember, we were, we were dealing with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, some of whom had very high support needs. Okay, so the average support hours per week ranged enormously from 37 up to, um, oh, I got that, sorry, from half an hour a week up to 356 hours a week. Uh, so this wasn't a way in which you could save money. Um, the average support hours per week uh, is there, you can read that yourselves. The financial support came from a range of different sources. Families were very uh, important contributors, not just financially, but in the time and effort they put uh, helping their son or daughter settle into the uh, ISL arrangement and so on. Uh, there was a wide range of community activities and work participation unfortunately reflects what happens in the, in the disability sector for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. That is, over a quarter of them attended day centres, which uh, we, we view as being not terribly uh, productive or developmental in their, in their uh, processes. Next, please. These were the manual review scores, just to give you an idea. Um, the two that uh, rated most highly, and although they virtually all rated three or more, so it's not a big difference, but still it is a significant difference. My home and one person at a time uh, rated most highly. Planning and social inclusion, which we think are probably two of the critical elements in, in accommodation support services. You've got to have substantial and, and clear planning in process, that is people have got much more of their lives to live. And secondly, the issue of social inclusion is a big issue. In m many congregate settings, it's, a, it's not a good issue at all. Okay, uh, one more. Um, we think that it's important that we develop future strategies uh, to enable uh, ISL opportunities, individual supported living opportunities to, to develop. Uh, and we need to engage essentially politically in order to raise this, uh, this objective uh, onto government agendas and the agendas of, uh, of uh, other service providers as well. And the last one, thank you. Uh, there are three key references um, that uh, Sorry, that I've listed there. Um, so we've, we've um, done a fair amount of publication around this project, more than these three, uh, but I think I'd better stop now before okay. he hits me with that. I sat a chair away and I thought he wouldn't be able to reach, but I'm not convinced. <laughs> Thank you, Harold. Thank you. <laughs> and it is indeed challenging. Uh, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, to bring these type of messages in, in, in just 10 minutes. Uh, it is difficult, but thank you for doing it uh, anyway. Um, indeed, this is about how to implement Article 19 of the UN Convention, living in the, in the community, being an active participant, uh, partner of that community, and that is only possible when you have uh, a place to live that allows you to live like you want to live, an accessible, an accessible home. And we have seen the model of, uh, of a, let's say, a, a prototype of a, a fully accessible uh, flat uh, and, and apartment. And we also um, saw from, from Canada the, the, the policy framework that was designed to make, uh, to make that possible to indeed uh, cover the cost for modification modifications you want to do to your home or to your, your vehicle, your cars, and then uh, Errol uh, digged into why, why is this so important because indeed people should be able to live in the community and not in segregating and segregated settings. So I'm sure that there are many questions, remarks, ideas, suggestions or other good examples. Who wants to start? We take three, four questions and then we turn back to the panel and that we do a few times. Uh, and we start with the lady there in the middle. Introduce yourself and then your question or remark, please. Use the microphone. Uh, 
Errol. I'm just wondering about the impact of the National Disability Insurance Scheme on programs to ensure people live independently, given there's a very large bureaucratic move to cut back on funding to individuals and yep. they have a preference for group living. Yeah. So let's go to that question in Spain and maybe also in, in Australia. After taking a few other questions, there was a gentleman in the back, please introduce yourself and your question. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Holden from the Centre of Independent Living in Northern Ireland. The question was really to Sonia about technology. Uh, much of our housing stock is very have little room for new buildings. Do you think modern technology can be integrated quite easily into existing property? That is indeed a very important question for, for many of us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Sonia, we'll uh, come back to you in a minute. Other question or remark? Please introduce yourself. Use the microphone, please. I'd like to ask, um, I think it's Errol, a couple of questions. Um, so I'm Zara Todd, I work for Project Scotland and I'm the former director of the European Network on Independent Living. Um, my questions are, when you were deciding not to use the word independent in your um, descriptors, did you um, do much consultation with disabled people's movement in Australia and my second question is given the rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Australia have you found any impact on people's um, willingness to try new things? Okay thank you and maybe a last question before returning to our panelists. No let's start with uh, you then, Sonia, two questions. Sorry. National insurance and uh, the uh, question from the gentleman from Northern I'm Ireland. I'm what sorry, about these old I, I need your help because I'm deaf and I couldn't help, I couldn't hear anything, so I need you to repeat. So the first question was yeah. um, the national insurance uh, mechanism, the funding of the state, does that help? What are the barriers? What are the problems? Uh, for us, the funding was uh, from the Royal Board on Disability in Spain, and it was help. It, it was a big help because without it, we, we couldn't develop the project. Uh, th there weren't any conditions, so we we, we developed the project with with it. There's no. There was Is there a program in Spain? from the authorities to help individuals that want to modify their uh, living arrangements? Uh, sorry? Is there state funding? Yes. If people want to change, modify their home? Ah, yes, there are, there are, there are many helps. Also, uh, with Fundación Once, we, we help with this. With this. Uh, so in Spain, I think it's not very easy, but, but you can do it. Okay. And then the second question was, what about old apartments, old flats? Is it possible with technology to make it uh, accessible or more accessible? Yes, of course. As I told you, the technology um, help us to, to do many things. For example, to open the windows, to open the door, to, uh, to use the, the bathroom. So technology is very, inter is, is very important at and is useful, useful not only for um, disabled people, for everybody. So, and, and we think that the design is also very important because you want to live in a house, not in a hospital. So the, beautiful, the beauty is also very important and we, we think on it. Thank you for that, uh, Sonia. Uh, Errol, um, are there national programs in Australia to, to support modification of, of cars and homes? Does it work? Does it contribute? Because from the video the presentation from our colleague from Canada, you might remember that uh, she showed this slide that only 25% of those that applied for, for uh, funding uh, got it. So it's, there seems to be a real problem there. How is the situation in, in your uh, country? Well, maybe I can answer it 
the, both questions about the NDIS as well as that particular question. Uh, unless you're from Australia, you're likely not to know a lot about what the NDIS is, but it's a, a major government policy uh, adopted a few years ago now called the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So it's based on an insurance model which many of us are very unhappy about. Um, but essentially it uh, intends to spend upwards of $32 billion uh, when it rolls out completely. Uh, and that money will be handed directly to people with disabilities and their families. So um, that project is well underway at the moment, but it's certainly not been smooth running. I could say a lot more, but um, I don't want to be disloyal. <laughs> Your body language says enough. That yeah, was clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, but from those, uh, from the way the uh, NDIS is meant to operate, it should provide funding for technical assistance if a person with a disability needs it. Uh, I think there's probably some debate about whether that would move on to rebuilding a house, for example, because there are, with this policy, there are tensions between the NDIS and uh, government employment agencies, between NDIS and education agencies, and so on, uh, simply because the NDIS is drawing a line on what it won't fund, and that's having implications for families and their capacity then to actually get money from health uh, or education or whatever for the additional support they want for their children. So some of us are um, very concerned about NDIS and, and its future impact. Um, certainly in the families that I've talked with, um, they, it varies a lot. Some are quite happy, uh, some are not very happy. And then the question with regard to independent living and uh, yeah, your approach I'm to that. I'm embarrassed by this because we didn't go to people with disabilities to say, you know, would you objectively use the term individual. And it was partly a political reason. We wanted to make very clear from the very beginning that uh, what we were talking about here. We weren't talking about people with disability becoming independent because you know, I've been in the field for f nearly 50 years and I know what that term means when it's applied in certain ways to people with disabilities. Uh, it, it stops them from uh, experiencing a whole lot of things in life that they would experience if they hadn't been labelled as not independent or not capable of being independent. So that, that's my excuse, weak as it may be. But we wanted to use the term individual to say we're talking about this person in their current situation, in their current level of development, in their current need, and so on, not whether or not they are independent. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, we have time for another round of questions or remarks. If you, have, or if you want to share a model of good practice from your region or your country, feel free to do so. Do we have requests for the floor? By the way, I brought the, these in, not, not to give you, but if you want to have a look, that's the reviewed, revised manual. That's the final report on the project, and this is a report that we sent out to participants, um, people who participated in the actual research. You might want to, if you're interested, you can thumb okay. through it. Thank you. Do we have more questions? for our speakers. Nobody? Should we ask somebody to do it anyway? Please, introduce yourself and then uh, your remark or your question. Hi there, uh, my name's Catherine Perry. Um, and I was formerly uh, the manager for the all-party parliamentary group on assistive technology in the UK. Can you speak a bit louder, please? I'll speak a bit closer to the microphone. Maybe that's more helpful. Um, my name is Catherine Perry, and I was formerly the, the manager of the all-party parliamentary group for assistive technology in the UK. Errol, you mentioned there briefly about the need to engage policymakers and start having more productive conversations that might actually relieve some of these, these issues that you were talking around there. I wonder if you might be able to give us some thoughts about how 
how to successfully do that, specifically in an area that's often quite complicated to understand and where um, policy makers often um, don't fully appreciate the, the breadth um, and need for um, assistive devices, but also for uh, accessible uh, and technology-friendly spaces. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Do we have more questions, or we try to answer this? The gentleman again, Northern Ireland, very active today, very good. <laughs> Sorry, the question was not clear. The house that Sonia has, can other nations hire it or borrow it so that we can show it to our own people? Oh, putting it on a European tour, so to say. Yes. Okay, that is, uh, that is a clear question. Okay, we have two questions. The first question is um, with regard to how do you engage with policymakers to make sure that they provide the needed legal frameworks and funding? In Spain, there are, I think in Europe also, there are laws about how the, the architects how, has, have to design the, the buildings uh, just to make them accessible. But um, we don't know why they don't do it. So um, we, we haven't found the, the way to ensure to use the, the laws because they already exist. But we have to take in account always the public administrations to award, to award uh, so awareness is a very important issue. It's the only way we have already now to, to do it. Awareness, awareness, awareness to sense it. it they, they really know that the things exist. So we have to be... Um, Constantly, constant, awareness yes, raising. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. that's the problem. And I can assure you, if you want to know how to organize effective uh, lobby work, talk to ONSE. They know how to do that. <laughs> uh, excellent, uh, I must say. The second question was whether that mobile flat could go on a tour in Europe, whether it could go to different countries. Yeah, uh, at the beginning of the project, no, at, at the end of the project, uh, we tried to, to move to Brussels. Uh, but there were problems with the agenda of the authorities, so we, we couldn't do it. But it was uh, one of our objectives. Uh, if, if we fi find the, the fundings, we could do it, but now the trailer, is, it doesn't exist. Ah, so the project stopped yeah, yeah, yes. completely. Yeah. So sorry, Northern Ireland, you will have to develop <laughs> your own solutions. Uh, Errol. How do you work with, with policy makers, decision makers, to make sure that they understand these issues? Because they are challenging. Eh? Mm -hmm. Universal design, accessibility, it is not self-evident. How do you work with, uh, with decision makers uh, to, 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 to make sure that the right legal frameworks and funding streams are provided? Well, that, that really is outside the work that we do. You know, what researchers are like, you know, we, we sort of define what we're doing and we're not too distracted by other issues. So we don't, we, we do engage with um, funders, for example, where the research that we do is funded, um, which means government and, and uh, bureaucracies are interested in the sort of outcomes that we, uh, that we get for it. But we don't, um, we don't sort of um, actively lobby Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we show the results or outcomes of our research and, and there is a lot of stuff in there that reflects, even in my own state, there are, is a significant number of people who have been living in uh, <laughs> congregate settings for many years and you know, we're not afraid to be absolutely explicit to our um, service providers that we don't think this is necessarily the best way to do it and this is another way of doing it which is going to have better outcomes. Okay. So we're, we're pretty focused in where we put our political effort and we're careful. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to share uh, a little story from my own, uh, from my own uh, history, so to say, my own practice. 
uh, I had a meeting with, with, with a few very high-ranked uh, officials in the European Commission in Brussels uh, some 20 years ago, uh, and, and um, I asked them, uh, why is it so difficult for you uh, to understand the needs of our, of our sector and the needs of persons uh, with a disability and, and the support services sector? And the reply of that person was very rude in a way, very simple, get organized and come back. And maybe that's what we should do more and more. We have to organize ourselves. We have to organize our sector. And then I think we can uh, achieve the results we, uh, we want to achieve. I would like to, uh, we, we are at the end of our workshop here. I would like to ask uh, you to give our two speakers uh, a warm applause and enjoy the rest of the day.